of how not to harm your loved ones during quarantine. Um, today we're going to talk about a couple different things, but just really quickly before we dive in, um, someone asked me or someone who knew my story that we talked about yesterday um, asked me why I didn't talk about the bar exam trauma experience. Um, and so here it is. Um, I um, absolutely positively was so sure that I was never that um, I did what some people might call some extreme measures. Um, you know, even though it had been my dream forever, um, it just was really uh, a scary time. So I. Um, after I took the bar exam, waiting for the results, um, instead of working and clerking and, and, or maybe I was doing that too at the same time, I really don't remember. Um, but I decided to take the builder's exam, like the builder's class to become a builder, like residential builder, um, and get my builder's license so that if I didn't pass the bar, I would have something to do. Um, and I also volunteered to work on some really interesting appeals that had to do with the satanic ritual abuse allegations that were being made against daycare workers all across the country. And through that volunteer work, I got to meet the experts um, on memory and suggestibility and, um, and different uh, different things that were being studied, um, you know, all the research was emerging at that point about the impact of interviews, the impact of adults who were trusted adults talking to kids, the impact of, of the surroundings in the context when a disclosure is made. Um, and so people like Maggie Brock, Deb Poole, uh, Stephen Cece, Michael Lamb, Elizabeth Loftus, um, can Google them, they're fascinating, all of them. Go on YouTube, love them all. Um, they were all people who were working on these appeals as well, but they were the actual researchers and who were doing the work to give um, the lawyers the basis to show the world that this was crap and that these people's lives should not be ruined over these false and fabricated and exaggerated um, allegations. So um, I'm, you know, an academic junkie, and so I began to really, really learn the research and really um, kept in contact with these people. And then when I had been, I did pass the bar, um, and then I went to a conference. Um, I had been a lawyer for about a year and a half. That was the National Child Abuse Defense Conference, and that was it. I, I was. I was in, and here I am, still in. So that's how I got involved in the world of um, child abuse and child witnesses and child sexual assault and protective services and custody battles and all that stuff. And so um, that's the, the addendum from yesterday. So um, let's get on it today. Um, today is a pretty cool day in Michigan. Because, um, you know, all those naysayers who uh, thought that the governor wasn't paying attention to our economy and to our state and to our future ability to thrive, uh, they kind of got it handed to them yesterday. Um, governor Whitmer is opening the Upper Peninsula and I think it's 17 counties in the Lower Peninsula. I could be wrong on that number. Um, it's basically, you know, if you were to kind of draw a line um, across the top of Michigan, do everything on our hand, you know, kind of across here from Traverse City, this area, Sheboygan, Traverse City, Petoskey, um, and, you know, some of the places uh, further east, um, they are opening. Um, I think Wexford County Cadillac was like the most southern uh, county that was being opened. Um, and they're being open with bars and restaurants and 
um, so that there can be uh, tourism uh, and the economy in Michigan will not uh, tank from uh, missing out on the revenue that will come because of the upcoming uh, Memorial Day holiday. So for those of you who don't know, we actually have a state law in Michigan that says that um, schools can't open unless they fall under certain exceptions until after Labor Day because the state was losing too much money um, by not having that weekend open for tourism um, in years ago. And so that's how that came to be. Um, and so schools are uh, asked to, start, public schools are asked to start after Labor Day so that um, we can have that revenue and bring all those people into our beautiful state. Um, so a little, couple other really huge updates. Um, some of them are sad, some of them are, are happy. Um, I guess the, the saddest one is that Central Michigan University um, has had to cut its track and field program because of the cuts in state funding for education, which we talked about weeks ago, um, due to COVID-19. And it's just sad to me that those kids won't have that opportunity. Um, the Canadian U.S. border was going to remain closed except for essential workers until June 21st. Um, then I guess we'll find out on June 21st what will happen then. Um, as far as our primary election, I believe it's August 4th, and the general election in November, um, there will be watcher mailboxes. Uh, there, there will be mail in absentee voting for every person in Michigan, and it will be mailed to your house. You don't have to go and get your absentee ballot at a government office. Um, it'll just be mailed to you, and you'll have that ability to use that to uh, exercise your right uh, for both elections. Um, yesterday, we had some really amazing numbers in Michigan. Um, I'm going to start with the one that I think is the best number, and that's that um, we now have 4,915, in my own writing, uh, deaths in Michigan, and that we only 24 people died yesterday. Um, you know, of course, as I've said before, um, one is too many. But at least we're not reporting hundreds per day anymore. Now we're 24. Um, and there were 773 new cases yesterday. And again, we talked about, you know, we have to keep the numbers in perspective that we have more testing now. So we're going to have more, uh, more cases. So just keep that in perspective. Um, the other thing, and this is really a lot out of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and you know, I just thought this was really helpful information, and I, I've read it really carefully because it's something that I'm concerned about in my own business. And that is how we're going to reopen and how we're going to reopen safely. So um, basically, everyone, there's two documents that everyone should know about, and the first one is um, the Michigan Safe Start um, brochure, which is a plan to re-engage Michigan's economy. This was published on May 7th, just you know, a week and a half ago. Um, it's on michigan.gov, and I will also upload it to our Facebook page. I have not yet, um, so that you can have this. And it basically, it, it goes through so that you know, you know, we're divided, our state is divided into these regions. It's backwards when you do it. Um, so it's about it's in these regions, and so um, basically we are opening by region. And so what's happened for Memorial Day is this region up here, which is region eight, and this region right here, which is region six, um, are open. Restaurants, bars, beaches, open with safety measures, though. Okay. So if you read through here, if you, if you get this and you read through it, it explains it's the six stages. 
we're in stage three. Um, when we talked about the other day, um, it's still the flattening phase as opposed to the phase four, which is the in improving phase. Um, and each page basically tells you, um, you know, what's going to happen. So in phase four, all these things are going to happen. It doesn't mean they're going to happen to the whole state because what's happening, as we know, because of the concentration of cases were down in the Detroit area, you know, they're going to be in phase three longer than other places in the state are going to be in phase three. So, um, but if you're interested and you want to plan, uh, this I will put it on our Facebook page right now. Uh, you have to go to michigan.gov and just put in um, Michigan Safe Start Plan and it will come right up. Um, the uh, other things um, to keep in mind, uh, and I think everyone should have this, um, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about enforcement in a minute, but for now, um, let's let's open before we can talk about enforcement. But there is the Michigan Occupation um, Occupational Safety and Health Administration has published these guidelines for reopening. Um, this I did already upload to our Facebook page, so feel free to grab it and um, print it. And um, it may, I think it's supposed to print. Uh, not in landscape. It's supposed to print in portrait. Mine's a little wonky because I hit the wrong key on my printer. See how it's all cut off. So, um, but just some some basic things um, that we'll talk about, and then you know, please feel free to to um, post your questions. Um, I'm really really nervous about uh, reopening my office, and I think that a lot of other people are too. Um, Mostly because, you know, I think that there's a, a thought out there that like, oh, I know you. Of course you're washing your hands. Or, you know, you wouldn't dare come in my office if you were symptomatic. Um, and that's, you know, I think a really easy default place to be. But um, I think that this is more serious than that. and. Um, I think that we all need to have, you know, a plan and a training for our employees or our tenants of what that plan is. And the, you know, this is going to be a very different way to do business. So, um, keeping in mind, you know, basically the, um, you know, this is best practices. This is not the law, um, and there, um, this just was uh, authored and published on May 4th, so it's very new, and um, you should, of course, continue to look at the Michigan OSHA website for updates. There's also links there um, to, if you need to report a violation um, of a business, and, you know, just if you want an inspection of a business, um, and any anyone can call out any business and say, hey, they're not complying. Uh, so that is something to think about, something to consider. Um, and so, first of all, um, the, it has a, it has a probably seven parts of it. Um, there's an overview of the coronavirus. In COVID-19, it talks about the applicable rules and regulations that give employers the rights to have a plan and enforce a plan. Um, it, it has a section on exposure determination and exposure control, um, and then establishing workplace procedures and what is recommended that you do, and that you have to provide training for your employees on these procedures. Um, I think that I can draw a parallel here. Um, you know, every employer is required to have an internet use policy. It's what protects them from getting in trouble if their employees are downloading child porn or or online gambling or something like that. Um, and 
But if you have the policy and you haven't trained your employees, and you, you're not absolved from getting in trouble in that circumstance. So you, it's not just having the, the exposure control plan and the uh, workplace procedures. You have to actually train your employees. It could be 15 minutes, but you have to do it. Um, and then there's a resource section. So um, I think at this point, we are all aware of the signs and symptoms. I'm not going to review them. We have I dealt with that for the last 10 weeks. And so um, I'll just talk to you a little bit about the law. And basically, um, the, the enforcement guidelines, um, there's a COVID-19 interim enforcement plan that is on the website, M-I-O-S-H-A.com. Oh, wait, it might be .gov. Um, and, but there's hot links like in, in the document. So you can just click it and it will take you there. Um, but the things that are relevant and things that people have to think about is um, personal protective equipment. Um, you know, are you in a plastic barrier? Or do you need to be supplying masks to people that come in your Door. Um, I mean, I would I would guess in most businesses, both of those, the answer would be yes. Of how you make those decisions, um, there um, should be a, there should be record keeping um, of everyone who comes in and out of your business, so that if someone does get sick and they're trying to find the source or trying to identify other people who were exposed or had contact so that they can keep it contained. Um, so it's recommended that uh, you have some sort of sign-in book, uh, whether it's the UPS person or the mail person or a client or a vendor, um, whoever it may be. You should have some sort of documentation of everyone in, everyone out, um, in addition to your employees. And don't forget that includes like if your kids come to visit you at work, which is what my kids do when they need money. So, um, you know, those are just some things to think about. Um, the, uh, it's, um, the, the general duties are um, set out in the, um, Michigan Occupational Safety Hazard Act um, 154, um, Section 5, and you, um, that's what gives authority for this all to be um, required, suggested, um, all of that. So let's talk about what some of these uh, things are. So exposure determination, that's kind of what I, what I just talked to you about, of why you should have a sign-in sheet. Um, it, it has to do with, um, you have to evaluate your business, um, and it needs to be posted if you are a very high risk, high risk, medium risk, or low risk. And, um, for example, like my office would be low risk because we don't have any jobs that require contact with people who are known um, or suspected of being infected. Um, we don't have frequent close contact within six feet with the general public, and um, well, we we do have a, we don't have any physical contact with coworkers, obviously, but we do we are in the same room in the same office, so it's minimal contact with coworkers. Um, going up to medium is jobs that require frequent and or close contact within six feet with people who may be infected, but are not known or suspected COVID-19 patients. Um, and then it's in areas without ongoing community transmission, workers in this risk group may have frequent contact with travelers who may return from locations where there's widespread COVID-19. Um, and then the other part of the medium risk is in areas where there's ongoing community transmission, workers in this category may have contact with the general public this is schools, 
high population density work environments, high volume retail settings. Um, so, um, and then it goes into high risk and very high risk and very high risk is obviously um, healthcare, laboratory workers, uh, morgue employees, people who are in direct contact as a result of their job. Um, so you want to, uh, uh, obviously, um, you need to consider how you're going to social distance based on your risk factor. So, you know, things to think about when you're talking about social distancing in the workplace would be um, staggered work shifts. Do you have some people work in the morning, some people work, you know, well, the middle of the afternoon to the evening uh, to keep your number of people in your business or in your office down at any one time. Um, you know, make, you should stagger um, any time that there would be gatherings. So you want to stagger lunch. You don't want everybody gathering at one table to eat lunch together unless they're six feet apart at different areas of the office. Um, obviously, some people may feel uncomfortable, and for those people, you may still want them to work at home. So you need to keep your network available to have people work at home um, if that's what makes them comfortable. Also, you need to cross-train your employees. You need to, to cross-train them so that if someone is sick or absent, um, others can pick up the slack without it risking your business. Um, you want to make sure that everyone in your office has access to every all the other resources in your office. So again, if someone's sick, if someone's absent, whatever it is, um, that can obviously be, a, you know, you can be ready for that. Um, you also have to make sure that you are um, keeping, uh, everything has to be cleaned and disinfected regularly. Um, there should be procedures and materials at every workstation. There should be procedures and materials at every, um, like at the copier, at the coffee machine. Um, it's going to be, you know, absolutely necessary that there are like Clorox wipes for people to wipe off the buttons at the copy machine after they make a copy. Um, and of course, um, it's going to be, you know, important for you to provide masks to not just people who are entering your business or your office, but also to your employees. And, um, and then the other thing to think about is, you know, if you, like I said earlier, if you do need the plastic uh, barriers, if you do need the shields um, and those kinds of things. Um, excuse me for one half a second. I just want to look through here really quickly and, um, and uh, then I'll be right back with you. Um, hold on one half a second. I'm really sorry um, that, that this is just necessary um, at the moment. Um, okay, I, I can't find it. I had saved something that I wanted to make sure to tell you about, but you know that I, I am this, um, you know, Techie, not genius. Um, and so, um, so I'm going to try to find it, and maybe it will, maybe it will come through as we're talking. But anyway, okay. So the next um, element of the plan is what's called the exposure control plan, and it needs to include the exposure determination stuff that I just mentioned, and then it also needs to um, have measures to prevent employee exposure. And a lot of that is um, the things that we just talked about, having the Clorox wipes next to the copier, next to the coffee machine, anything that is commonly touched. Um, you may want to have a hand sanitizer uh, dispenser right by your door so everyone in is washing their hands, everyone out is, is at least sanitizing their hands. Um, there are, uh, you should have stickers or tape 
uh, on your floor that shows, like if I'm sitting at my at my desk, um, it should be a you know a a line or a marking on the floor that shows where six feet is from where I'm sitting, um, so that we can move our guest chairs to that point. That's where people can. Uh, can come in uh, and know where they should be standing to keep safe distancing, social distancing. Um, again, you absolutely must do um, you must do training on all of this. Um, you want to make sure uh, that you have uh, dealt with some of the engineering controls that you have clean air filters, that um, your ventilation system is working. Um, if you can, it's suggested you have a drive-through window. Um, so just, you know, just things to think about. Um, you know, you also need to update your, um, your policies. You know, are you, if someone is, is, you know, has a sniffle, ordinarily they would come to work. If you have to think about as an employer, are you going to now ask them to stay home and if you are going to ask them to stay home, is that going to count against their personal off days or their sick days? Um, so these are all discussions that you know we need to have with our employees, and everybody needs to be on the same page because you don't want anyone to come to work if they don't want to give up their days. Um, and you know certainly it would it depends on the circumstances and the relationships and everything else, but just something to think about. Another thing that you want to think about is do you need to restructure the physical plant in your business or your office so that there is um, more physical space between employees, more physical space between the customers and the employees. If that means that you have to move, you know, for example, the, um, you know, you have to move the copy machine um, or you need to separate the uh, cubicles so that people are further apart, then that's something that's recommended. You should be providing um, hand sanitizer um, and everyone's desk. Um, and I'm not talking about like those huge, giant, you know, gallon sized things. Um, hand sanitizer. It can be, you know, anything. It can be the, just a, a pumper. It can be the kind that's a little pen that sprays. Um, there's many, 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 many different varieties. Um, another thing uh, to, to think about um, is having a sign that it, it's a no contact office, that we don't shake hands, we, you know, whatever it is. You should also have um, wipes or some sort of uh, mechanism to clean um, the phones in your office, as well as you may want to invest in. Um, and I'm going to give you a resource for all, all of this at the end. Um, you may want to have one of their, um, their like phone vaults. And it, it's like a rectangular box. It has the ultraviolet light in it. You can put your phone, your keys, your credit card, your pen, your whatever in there. And in five minutes, it's completely disinfected and sanitized. And, you know, that's something that um, I bought one for, for our office for people coming in. And then I bought uh, one that I just have for me, um, which my employees can obviously all use too. But think about it. Someone comes in, they have, they have their keys, they have their phone, they have everything that they've been touching that's been on the counter of every store they've been in. And now um, we're, we're, so now they can put it in our lobby in this little sanitizer box for five minutes. And now they're not bringing the whole rest of the world's germs into my office. So um, just another thing to think about. Um, we also, we might need holders for um, our masks or our hand sanitizers or whatever in our lobby. So that's, you know, another thing to think about that, you know, it's not just gonna, I, mean, I don't think anyone's gonna have a human just standing there passing it out. So, um, you know, those are some things to think about. Um, you know, you may need gowns, you may need gloves, you may need goggles. Um, it just depends on the job. Um, employers can make it mandatory for customers to wear masks. That is completely legal. And, um, and um, 
and you know remember that masks are voluntary if there is social distancing so while you're working you know day to day if your employees are spaced out properly then they don't need to wear masks while they're there they may have to if they're going into your kitchen or they're going somewhere where they wouldn't be exercising social distancing, but just something to keep in mind. Um, the, they encourage people to have some sort of respiratory protection, which is masks. Um, and, you know, there's a million different kinds of masks and different costs for masks and there's throwaway and there's, washable and there's filtered and there's unfiltered and um, that's really a, a personal preference and cost determination. Um, in the manual you'll see it has um, difference between face coverings and respirators and um, so that's a resource that you can look at. Um, you have to have procedures as I mentioned earlier and it's Basically, um, you know, you have to have disinfectant, you have to have wipes, you have to have a way to um, protect your workplace. The key elements of the work workplace procedures are, um, you know, developing the exposure control plan that we already talked about. You have to have a COVID-19 workplace um, coordinator. Um, and you have to examine and update your policies. You have to have a policy for um, telework as well as for leave and employee compensation. You have to identify if any of your staff are essential um, and what their business functions are. And I'm not talking about identifying them by name. I'm talking about identifying them by um, their position or by their tasks or duties, so you don't have to rewrite this if we ever have to do it again. Um, and again, you should establish a chain of communication. Um, if there is something that is bothering someone, something that's making them uncomfortable that someone else is doing in your office, you probably would find it useful to establish a policy and a procedure in advance um, as to what they should do in that situation and assure them that there will be no uh, ramifications to them personally or consequences to them personally for bringing it to your attention. All of this is for the safety and the better of most people it can be. Um, and the last part of the, of the workplace procedure plan um, is that you have to have training. <laughs> Again, you have to have training. Um, there are things that, um, you know, that if you are a landlord as opposed to a, a tenant, um, you know, you have to have your HVAC and your water systems um, reviewed to make sure that they're not contaminated, they're properly filtering, things like that. Um, there is a, a section of this it's about cleaning procedures and you know I've already talked about some of those but um, you know it's just really important to, for people to be aware every time they touch something they have to clean it um, and the difference between cleaning and disinfecting cleaning is just the removal of germs dirt um, impurities um, it doesn't kill the germs it removes them and soap and water is clean. Disinfecting is using chemicals to actually kill the germs on the surfaces. Um, so think of it as, you know, cleaning dirty dishes, um, you know, you're removing the germs, you're killing the germs. Um, and it's really important to remember that non-disinfected surfaces um, allow co the COVID-19 virus to live for two weeks, where on services that are disinfected, it's hours. Um, so that's a pretty important uh, distinction. Um, and then they basically say that 
in order to have an effective disinfectant, you need to have 70% alcohol or it has to have bleach um, and, you know, things that are fine or you can use like Windex, you can use any Comet disinfecting cleanser, you can use Lysol, you can use Clorox, you can use some of the organic uh, Simple Truth, um, you know, that, that all is okay according to the, the standards. Um, there's also, you have to have procedures in your manual that talk about um, what employees are to do if they feel sick or they're experiencing, experiencing COVID-19 symptoms. Um, in addition to telling you, you have a duty as an employer to contact the local and state health department and report it. Um, there are um, all kinds of, of coding issues that are explained in here that are pretty, uh, they're, they're, they're pretty confusing. And I guess that's why I don't do like insurance billing because a lot of, you know, round hole, round peg kind of stuff. Um, so the other thing uh, you have to have um, in place are, you know, you have to tell your employees that, you know, they're, they're not supposed to cough in their hand. They're supposed to cough, you know, in their elbow. They're, if you sneeze, you must dispose of the Kleenex. You can't put it on the table or the desk or shove it up your sleeve or whatever, you know, things that we know, no one ever even thought of before. You have to have a period of time before you allow someone to come back to work if they do have COVID-19. So it's recommended that it's at least 72 hours um, without symptoms and without the use of a fever reducing medicine. So it's not like, oh, I haven't had a fever for two weeks because I have been taking, you know, Tylenol. It literally has to be after all that stuff has stopped. Um, that's when you start counting. Um, and you have to have no shortness of breath or respiratory symptoms at all. And it has to be at least seven days since the symptoms first appeared. Um, and those are based on the current CDC guidelines for isolation. Um, so then um, let's talk about how, what our obligation is as far as training our employees. Um, you know, it's basically kind of writing your manual with, you know, the uh, hygiene etiquette and the practice and, you know, one of the things that is recommended is that, if you, this is right in here, see this little sticker, oops, I always in the wrong place of the camera. So see this wash your hands sticker, um, which, that wash your hands sticker. That is something that um, should be posted in your bathroom um, or in your kitchen uh, by the sink to remind people to sing happy birthday or some other song they prefer for 20 seconds to make sure that they're washing their hands properly. Um, put soap on wet hands, not dry hands, just things like that. Um, so you need to talk about that. You need to talk about, you need to tell them, although I'm sure they already know how it's transmitted, that's part of the training. You need to tell them the measures that have been put in place. Um, and you need to make sure that you have some sort of training module available for new employees, whether it's um, that you record your training when you do it initially and then new employees can just watch it or you have it all in writing as a transcript, um, but you it's another form. When you hire someone, um, it's recommended, not required, but that you have um, that they acknowledge that they've gotten your COVID-19 uh, in, in business practices training. Um, you also, you know, want to reiterate to them the sick policy, the leave policy, um, if any sort of, you know, drive through, um, if there is any, if there's going to be shift changes, um, prepare them, make sure that if you're going to change a shift, 
that you're sensitive to, you know, if Joe, you know, his wife is working, you know, this shift, so he needs to work this shift, so, you know, or the same shift because they don't have child care, or, you know, you just, you need to be, um, these are different times. You need to make sure that you are cognizant of switching hours or switching days and how that would impact families as well. Um, and then there's a bunch of resources. Um, a lot of Michigan's resources have been uh, taken from the Maryland Department of Labor, um, which is funny to me because, you know, in the scheme of things, we were hit so much harder than they were, but they seem to be much more ahead of the curve when it comes to respirators and face coverings, and that's the section that Michigan adopted from them. Um, as I said before, um, I already uploaded this to the Kirsch Daskis Facebook page. It should be right above where you click to watch me right now. And um, so if you want to uh, download a copy and start working on all these plans right now, you can while we're still working at home. So uh, with that, I will, um, I'm going to scroll and see if anybody has any questions. Put my glasses back on. And, um, and I want to make sure that, um, okay, so there's a few things on here. So first of all, um, um, on the part where you clicked, um, or it says resource, wendy at smgusa.net, um, all the stuff I just told you about, the hand sanitizer, the mask, the stickers, with the feet for six feet away, the sticker for the, you know, the sticker for the mirror right by the sinks. If they, you know, every, everything I just told you about, um, the sign-in book, the gloves, emailer, she'll get you everything. She can put your logo on it. She can do a blank. She can put some silly slogan on it. Um, we actually put on our hand sanitizers um, we, we're giving them out to our, our clients as well, and we put on them stay clean. The police never think it's as funny as you do. So you can you can play around, you can have fun with it. Um, as I said, you need holders to put the stuff in in your lobby. Or you may need the large hand sanitizer thing and the stand and the re um, not rewrotable. That's the word I'm thinking of. Uh, refillable. Uh, <laughs> So those are things that uh, you may, but she can help you, Wendy, at smgusa.net, and I have it posted as well. And then, um, and so um, other things, um, and then uh, other things Wendy said is that in boxes for all documents and packages, um, you need to put you need to put them somewhere other than your desk or your chair. So you need to have like a different policy for how you distribute your mail and distribute your uh, any packages that come. You may want to have a cleanable surface to put them on. You may um, you you know you may want to have some kind of, of spray. Um, I know that we're using something called Microbrand right now. Um, we spray our mail, we let it sit for three days, and then we open it and read it. Um, we're really relying on everybody using email so that we don't miss anything. But um, that's, we, there's a lot, not as much coming in for sure, but it still is. Um, there's also uh, something called um, Clean Captain um, that sprays down doorknobs, faucets, kitchen. Um, at the end of the day, uh, so you could designate a person to do that if you if you need to. Um, and then let me just see if we have any else on here. Um, it doesn't look like we do in that regard, but um, I wanted to show you something really cool if I can find it. Um, this is something I have in my car. Little thing, and um, you can spray it. Um, you know, da -da -da -da, on your screen or on your phone, and then um, you use this colored part and you just, you know, wipe it off like that. 
and then you have gotten you've disinfected your screen um, or your phone or any any screen really um, and that little gray part comes in different colors um, and she also oh she has those little boxes too I got my box for her too um, and so the, those are all my all my tips for how to reopen your business safely. Um, it is a lot of responsibility for employers, but uh, I think it will be well worth it, um, and and that we will definitely, um, you know, we will we will have I hate the expression the new normal, but we will have a new place that we call normal, and. Um, Hopefully, we'll all be healthy in it. So, five reasons not to harm your loved ones during quarantine. Number one, protective services workers are essential. Number two, the police are essential. Number three, our jails and prisons are a hotbed of breeding COVID-19 germs. Um, very hard to socially distance there, very hard to quarantine there. Um, better now than it was 10 weeks ago, but still um, a very dangerous place to be. Um, number four, uh, parents can get in trouble for kids being kids. And number five, because uh, very few people, if anyone, looks good in horizontal stripes. So with that, um, I will say goodbye to you today. If you have any questions, you know, shoot us a message through Facebook or through email um, or through our website. Uh, or just post it on our page. I'm happy to help you. Um, I will try to post um, some some sample um, workplace uh, plans um, that you can just kind of cut and paste and plagiarize and adopt from um, just sort of a framework. Um, I'm hoping to have that up by the end of the week. So. Um, that's pretty much, and that I'm going to distribute by email. So you will need to send me, um, you can send an email to Gabby, G-A-B-B-I, at kdlawgroup.com um, and ask for a copy um, in the email. Um, and we'll be happy to send it to you as a Word document so that you can adapt it to your business. And, fill in the blanks and it will be easier for everyone. So with that, uh, I wish you all a very, very wonderful day. I hear it's supposed to clear up and be sunny in a while. And, um, and so stay home, stay healthy, be happy, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.